Thank you very much. I'd like to. Uh, well, I'm going to wait on introducing our student, new student representatives this year because Rebecca's going to be a few minutes late. So we're going to move right on to the roll call, please. Chairman Carson. Here. Council Berry. Here. Council Fritz. Here. Council Watson. Here. Council McGinty. Here. Council Roberts. Present. Council Swift Kayata. Here. Thank you. Do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to call on John Green, please. Um, come, and uh, we have a, the next item is presentations, and I'm going to turn this over to John. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Green. I'm a member of the Conservation Commission. Tonight, the uh, Conservation Commission is pleased to recognize the winners of the fourth annual essay contest that we sponsor. We'd like to acknowledge those individuals who contributed to the success of this contest, and I would first like to thank fellow commission member Linda Francescone for making this contest a reality, and she could not be here tonight. Uh, Ms. Nancy, Ms. Nancy Hutton and the faculty of the middle school has welcomed the efforts of the commission and encouraged all the students to participate in this contest. The faculty assigned the essay as classwork and assisted the students in producing thoughtful, well-written essays. We would like to thank Ms. Mary Ann Casey, Ms. Kathy Walsh, and Ms. Ms. Cynthia Curry for their assistance. We would also like to thank the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for sponsoring the first runner-up prize this year. Ms. Susie Kiss, Executive Director of the Land Trust, recognized each and every student who participated. Finally, we thank the Cape Courier for printing the winning essays. We appreciate the opportunity to share the wonderful ideas of these children with the town. This year, as always, the winners were extremely difficult to choose. We asked the students to relate how kids can help preserve the natural beauty of Cape Elizabeth. A well-crafted, thoughtfully written essay was submitted by our first prize winner, Anna Metzger. I don't know if Anna is here tonight. She is. Mm -hmm. I'd like to present you this certificate of achievement for the wonderful essay you wrote published in the Courier, which is great. And uh, you will spend a week at conservation camp courtesy of the commission. So we hope you enjoy that. John, have a turn toward the yep. camp. Thank you very much. <laughs> I turn toward you. <laughs> the first runner-up prize will be awarded uh, by the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Dr. Joseph Schenkel will present the award on their behalf. As all of us know, uh, preserving the Cape's natural beauty is important for all of us who, who live here and, and all the folks that visit here also. And it's indeed a pleasure to see such young people demonstrating their awareness of, of all that threaten that beauty, uh, yet at the same time offering suggestions on what to do about it and how to preserve it. Uh, it's my belief and many others that their obvious concern and, and those of others is what will enable us to continue to feel so fortunate to be able to call uh, Cape Elizabeth our home. I might insert something here. Uh, Scott Karras, uh, our, our uh, runner-up, um, is not the first in the family. And in fact, last year, uh, his sister was also a prize winner, uh, which I'm not sure what that tells us, but I'm sure it's something quite good. Um, I'd like Scott to come up, if he would. Surely it is a pleasure for me to present a $100 savings bond to Scott. And 
<laughs> we must upstage that, of course, and I don't, whoops, dropping everything. I don't know what would uh, be complete without the ubiquitous T-shirt. <laughs> and we have one for you. Show the council, turn around and show the council. Oh, I'm sorry. So they can see it. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And Scott, also a year's membership in the land trust. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure when you can be part of these presentations for young people in our community or in any community. Sometimes they get such a bad rap, but they're out there doing their thing, and it's nice to be able to recognize them. Uh, I'd like to move on, please, to reports and correspondence from members of the council. Henry. My first. Uh First, the, uh, the county budget uh, advisory committee is having a, a, a meeting the 16th and the 23rd of September. For those interested, uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth spends about uh, a, a half a million dollars a year uh, to run the county. Uh, that's our, our share. And uh, so those who are interested uh, may want to check on uh, the, the 16th and the 23rd of the presentations of the budget. Uh, as for the town of Cape Elizabeth uh, Historical Preservation Committee, we're having a meeting on the 21st at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon, uh, 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 Council Fitz and I and uh, the members of the committee are holding a meeting of uh, the Cape Elizabeth uh, Historic Preservation Committee at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we plan to run through uh, some of the material that the consultants have been uh, examining on those properties in uh, Cape Elizabeth that are considered to have some architectural uh, significance for historic properties. We're going to look over some of those things. Uh, Maureen McGovern, uh, Ma Maureen O'Mara, uh, excuse me, our uh, town planner has been working very hard with our committee and uh, with the consultants, and uh, she has uh, information on some of these. Uh, the criteria and properties, uh, if you'd like to check with her or any members of our committee. That's my request. Thank you very much. Yep. We all threw on one side here. <laughs> yes, the Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This past uh, month, I had the good fortune of being able to represent the town once again at a trail dedication on behalf of uh, Penny and the rest of the council. And the trail dedication was at Hobstone. There's a 20-acre parcel of land back there that through the efforts of the Hobstone Condominium Association, the Land Trust, and the town, there was a collaborative effort put together to put this trail in. Richard Haupt from the Land Trust was, the, I guess, the moving force behind it. And uh, Councillor Fritz was there and joined me as well at the, at the dedication. It's a beautiful piece of land. I had not walked on that one, and there aren't too many that I haven't. And I would uh, welcome anybody to go in there, and it's uh, very ro rocky. Uh, very wooded. It's a, a neat little uh, refuge from the more urban areas that we have in town. And again, I'd like to thank the Land Trust and Hobstone and the town uh, taxpayers that, through the Land Acquisition Fund uh, for this effort. And we're, we're making progress in, in setting some land aside for the future. Thank you very much. Are there any other reports from councillors? If not, I'll move on to the uh, manager's report. Yes, I'm gonna, I'll make this very brief. Uh, I think everyone has noticed quite a few projects that have gone on in Cape Elizabeth over the summer, and I'd like to thank all of the volunteers who worked on those, all of the employees, uh, as well as the contractors. I think, I think they've done a fine job. I also want to use the opportunity, I see Dan Hannigan in the back here, who's a member of Engine One Company. Uh, one of the many volunteer aspects that, some of the volunteer aspects that folks do never get recognized, and Dan is one of the two co-organizers along with Sergeant Brent Sinclair of the Cape Elizabeth Police Department of the Town Golf Tournament. And that was held about two weeks ago, and there were quite a few folks in this room who participated in the golf tournament. And I really want to thank both Dan and, and Brent, as well as the Perpudic Club, for uh, 
hosting that golf tournament, and uh, it's really good to see the employees participate that and having a good time. So, thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to continue with the presentations. I think I'll do it from down here. <coughs> I can speak to the audience and not to the council. <coughs> Important as they are. <clears throat> Tonight it's my honor to, to describe to you and to present the Ralph T. Gould Award for 1999. This award, established in 1986, was named for the late Ralph Gould to recognize his community service and subsequently to recognize those who provide community service in the same spirit as Ralph Gould. Growing up in Cape Elizabeth, I was indeed very fortunate to know him and to spend time at his house with his wonderful clocks and cars and other wonderful hobbies that he had. Recipients since Mr. Gould, uh, <clears throat> recipients for this award have been Bill Orcutt, who has done much for the youth of the community, Judy Simons, a strong advocate for the arts, recycling and a past school board member, Dick O'Donnell for his efforts on behalf of the elderly, Henry Adams for numerous works on behalf of the town, the late Loretta Pond for her service on school issues, E. Irving Chapel, former Boy Scout leader and director, director of emergency preparedness for over 25 years, and Peter and Alice Rand for their volunteer work on environmental issues to protect the town's, states, the town's and the state's natural resources. Three years ago, the recipient was the <clears throat> late John Sibley, who did so much for the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department. Two years ago, it was presented to Wendy Jerswick and to Ellen Van Fleet for their work on the Cape Curry. Last year, the recipient was William H. Jordan, who has given legendary service to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Tonight, in the 12th year of the award, we add somebody whose service in any single year would qualify them for this recognition. And this person has provided service to the community for over 25 years. This year's recipient is Leland P. Murray, Jr., Jimmy. here now, we have to have a list of the things that he's done, just a little beginning. <laughs> Jimmy Murray joined the fire department as a member of the rescue company in 1970. Five years later, <laughs> are they calling you? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> they better not be calling you because we got everybody here. Five years later, he became captain of the Cape Elizabeth Rescue Company and served until 1986 when he was named deputy fire chief for the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department. This adds up to nearly 30 years in key fire department leadership, leadership positions. Yet the official service in the fire department is just a small piece of the overall good work that Jim does for the community. When the town set about to build a new track and soccer field in the early 1980s, Jim, along with his mother, Eleanor Ro Westcott, <laughs> Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor Westcott donated the land that enabled the soccer field to be built. When the fire department wanted to fix up the old garage in back of the town hall to house the old fire equipment, again, a land donation was made. Every year since 1982, Jimmy has donated the use of a flatbed truck as a stage for the family fun day. Every family fun day, we also admire a great fireworks show, which has all of its labor and much of the individual fireworks themselves donated by Jimmy. Jim has also donated to graduating classes, to many youth activities, and to other projects throughout Cape Elizabeth for many years. Another recent example of Jim's helpfulness to the town is that he and his wife, Carol, have invited many municipal groups to their home in Peebles Cove. In 1999 alone, 1999 alone Jim and Carol hosted four separate lobster bakes, including for the Engine 2 75th anniversary reunion the rescue company, the wet team, and the Cape Elizabeth Benevolent Association. 
Each event was well attended and everyone enjoyed Jim's fine cooking and Carol's exceptional hospitality. And if all of the above was not enough, Jimmy Murray, about a dozen years ago, resurrected a wonderful Cape Elizabeth tradition. Over a thousand citizens now attend Cape Elizabeth's Memorial Day Parade and Memorial Day exercises each year. This is good, huh? It's very good. Put it all in order, huh? In the late 1980s, there was no parade, and the Memorial Day exercises were not at all appropriate in recognizing those who had given so much to us. This past Memorial Day, we once again saw Jim's organizing talent with a great parade, followed by a moving ceremony, which has included a Coast Guard helicopter overhead. On behalf of the entire town of Cape Elizabeth and the entire town council, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the Ralph T. Gould Award to Leland P. Murray, Jr. say that at my age I haven't been able to squeeze that many volunteer things and he was actually two or three years behind me in school, weren't you? Couple. Congratulations, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I want to thank the council because it is an honor um, and the townspeople. Um, it, it's a great town and I never questioned of doing anything to help it. So. I'm proud to be a citizen and a taxpayer on the town of Cape Elizabeth. So thank you very much. <laughs> Probably wondering why I bought the hip boots tonight. <laughs> why are you laughing that way, Henry? I don't want to if I could, for a moment, I'd like to do something that, uh, when I heard I was coming to the council meeting, that I wanted to present. And you were talking about it when I came in tonight was the, uh, the uh, Donnie Webster Memorial Golf Classic. Well, here in our audience, we, <laughs> we do have a slamming Sammy Sneed. Right? And that's who I'd like to refer to for a moment, the slamming Sammy Sneed. It appears, I guess, that um, his pay must be down a little because he was trying to retrieve a golf ball in the water. <laughs> he didn't have enough money, I guess, to buy a floater. So he's over there in the muck trying to retrieve his golf ball, of which he finished his last three holes barefooted. And if it wasn't for a couple of people to help him get his sneaker out, he'd have been in worse trouble. So, Mr. McGovern, would you come down here a minute? <laughs> I hope you all the next time you get wet. And again, thank you very much. It's an honor. He's been very quiet about that, Jimmy. He hasn't told anybody the story, and we were just talking tonight about how we might get the story out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It, it was good. The hip boots were good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there any citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda? Yeah, hearing none. <clears throat> we go to the minutes, please. Yeah. Approval of the minutes of the August 9th, 1999 meeting. Madam Chair. Yes, Henry. I make a motion that we approve the minutes of the August 9th, 1999 council meeting as read. Second. 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 Are there any discussion? Um, Madam Council Chair, Watson. I just wanted to make the um, observation that in the minutes we referred to the fact that um, in the, the fees for the new uh, swimming program and, and health center that there was a question about um, individual student fees. And we received a memo from Sue Weatherby saying that because the open swims are most going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the most any one student could swim outside of an organized program is three times per week. Therefore, the student fees are so low that paying as you go seems to be the best individual option. Uh, in many ca cases, the kids that do frequent the open swim are part of a family pass option. So I just wanted to make sure that we address that because it was an open issue in our meetings. And, and we have uh, addressed it. So. OK. Any other errors, omissions? Thank you all. It's a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Opposed? 
Thank you. The motion carries. I'd like to, um, yes. Yeah, I, if I could just for a minute. I cut my presentation short when I saw Mr. Murray come in, and I was afraid he might not stay till the end of the presentation. But I did also want to mention as part, part of the town manager's report uh, that Maureen O'Meara was recently elected the president of the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association, and she takes office effective October 1. Uh, this completes her previous service as the, uh, the main director on the group, and now she's moving up to president. So it's a great honor uh, for the town of Cape Elizabeth, but even more so, and particularly a great honor for Maureen. And I know you joined me in congratulating her. We only have the best Maureen in Cape Elizabeth, the top. <laughs> no. yes, yes, I'd also, uh, to go back again to our earlier things that uh, Jimmy's arrival in the room stopped everything, um, we'd like to introduce now our student representatives for this year. Uh, we have Rebecca Bolas, who is just here, and we have Andrew Rowe, um, and Andrew's father is on the school board, is that correct, Andrew? Yes, he is. Yes. Uh, Start of a political dynasty, for Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's much fun to be a student when your parents on the school board. That could be a little problem. <laughs> I guess it does. We are, we are glad to have you here, and we look forward to serving with you this year. Um, now, we are at item number 30. Consideration of a request to authorize the town to participate in the community project program of the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department. Should I turn it over to Mark I'll first? Briefly. Okay. Yes, uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, back during the budget session, Councillor Henry Berry brought before the town council uh, the possibility of possibly using the sheriff's department for some community policing programs, community policing, community service programs, right. uh, as a way of both saving the town funds as, 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 well of, as well as a way of helping some of the folks that are uh, in the Cumberland County Jail in terms of re-entering and doing positive things into society. Uh, we did have, uh, sub subsequent to that, there was one citizen who had some concern about it, and we decided to put off consideration uh, of it until fall. Uh, now that fall is here, we're uh, very pleased to be able to present this again. Uh, what the specific projects in Cape Elizabeth would be, uh, initially, uh, it would be looking at the long garage that's at Fort Williams and back of the Officers Row buildings. The roof's been falling off that and we've been looking at that as, as a real good, strong possibility of them replacing the roof. That would save the town about uh, $15,000 by having them do it instead of by contracting it out. But I really want to say I, it, that I, I think it's a good program, and I'm really pleased that Sheriff Mark Dion uh, is here this evening. In the 20 odd years that I've worked for the town, it's the first time I've ever seen the Cumberland County Sheriff come to a meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. And, Oftentimes you read in newspapers or elsewhere the sheriff shows up to a council meeting and it's usually not for something positive. So uh, it's good to see the sheriff and uh, he had to answer any questions and to tell you about the program. Thank you, Mark. Mark and I go back a long way to the Portland Police Department. We're happy to see you in your new job. I know she marshaled me as a foot patrol officer, much like she marshals all of us. <laughs> I survived. Uh, I hope you do too, uh, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the council. I spoke with uh, Manager McGovern some time ago and Councilman Barry about the possibility of the Sheriff's Office doing work in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and there's a third reason I want to add to what the managers articulated is I firmly believe that the Sheriff's Administration has a responsibility to return something tangible to the communities that underwrite our efforts. Uh, the Town of Cape Elizabeth does in fact provide $500,000 to county government and I'm responsible for the expenses associated with 70% of that. Uh, I think returning uh, labor to the community is important. The inmates that participate in this uh, do so voluntarily. They're anxious to leave the institution on a given day and do work. Oftentimes, it's the most tangible thing they do while they're incarcerated. And uh, it's my pleasure to report that oftentimes the response from the community is such that it's probably the first opportunity they've had hear someone say thank you. Uh, and that goes miles in rehabilitation as opposed to anything we do in terms of programs inside the secured perimeter. Uh, Cape Elizabeth has been a community that has never received the benefits of those programs in terms of community projects uh, that need to get done. Uh, our staff has looked uh, at the project that the managers outlined. I do think we can bring it under 
uh, a cost that would make it more acceptable to you. Therefore, you'd have the discretion to spend your monies elsewhere. Uh, but I do appreciate uh, Manager McGovern's uh, opportunity for us to make this presentation to you, and I stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, yes, <clears throat> we're okay. Uh, Sheriff, how long has this program been going on? It has been going on. Um, actually, I have to give credit to Sheriff Choice two administrations ago. It was done on a very small scale. Uh, one of the points when I ran for sheriff was to do what is necessary to expand that uh, and to expand the scope of the inmates that are eligible to participate. Um, so you will see more of us out there doing things. And we try to keep one team that's very flexible. You'll note in your packet that we did the uh, raking at Willard Beach. That was an example of something that uh, South Portland City Government wasn't prepared to do, uh, which is different than wanting to do. They just didn't have the resources available to them in terms of manpower uh, to get the job done. We were able to send a team out twice and take care of that for them. So I think if we uh, meet managers' expectations and your expectations here, we can be more flexible on the types of work that we can do for you in the future. Councilor Barrett. Uh, Sheriff. Councilor McGinty, are you done? I'm sorry. Have, Actually, I, I did have another question, and that was, sure. did we get any input from our police chief on this program? Yeah, I, I spoke to Chief Pickering about it. He supports uh, this particular program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Barry. Uh, what, uh, Madam Chairman, I just had a, a, a question for the folks at home, Sheriff, perhaps. Uh, there will be no violent. Persons uh, who have been convicted of violent crimes in these uh, groups, right? I, uh, I have to be honest. Yes, I mean, it depends how you d you define violence. Well, uh, in terms, have yep. they had a history of assault? It's possible. That have was they, one of the concerns that was uh, was expressed by uh, some of the people in the town. I, I think that's a legitimate. Fear, mm. uh, but it's uninformed. W what's right? I, I support your program. I, I, I know that you and I first talked about this uh, months ago and thought it was a, an excellent idea. But uh, for the uh, benefit of the uh, folks who are uh, uh, participating in the uh, meeting through uh, television, uh, perhaps I'd like to know the approximate ratio of the uh, supervisors to the inmates on these projects. Four or five to one. Four or five to one. So, so that's right. I, four I or think five in a crew and one uh, supervisor. That's right. For I think for the, uh, the citizen that's watching is they have to understand there's been careful screening of the candidate. Sure. Um, and I, I think that'll satisfy most of the concerns that they might have. Right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Fritz, did you? Um, could you tell us something about how, like, say, if, if we did engage the prisoners to do the roof at Fort Williams, how would they be supervised um, in, in terms of the expertise in roofing? Would, it, would any of our personnel be involved? Um, how, how would it work? I think what would be important is the job supervisor would sit down with the manager or his designee. Uh, we would work out a work plan. I would expect that there would be a job captain, preferably somebody associated with town government. And we would, we would be providing the bulk labor, the grunt work, per se. Uh, I would look to the town to provide the expertise in terms of assigning the work that has to be done. Uh, the deputy who manages the program uh, has, uh, would be considered a mill right in the private sector. Uh, he does mason work, carpentry, electricity, plumbing. Uh, he can handle the jobs as they're assigned. But the town would be responsible to clerk the works, per se. Councilor Watson. Um, Sheriff Dean, how many inmates are we talking about um, being on this project, do you know, at this, at this point? I think that would depend on the expectations of the town. Okay. And the timeline, of course, extends with the fewer personnel that you have assigned. Um, as you may or may not be aware, one of our citizens was concerned about safety in Fort Williams. As you, as you are aware, it's frequented by a lot of uh, young mothers who walk there with their small children, a lot of children play there. And having lived across from the park and used it myself, I also had some of those same concerns. But I have to tell you that the letter that you presented to us 
help to um, alleviate some of those concerns when I saw that your inmates have been on such projects as the, the Church of Holy, um, the Holy Spirit in Portland, the Wyndham Town Hall pl Playground, the um, Willard Beach Cleanup in South Portland, the Southern Maine Soapbox Derby, and working at the New Gloucester Memorial School. That information was very helpful in helping me to come to terms with how, how much at risk we may be putting our citizens by having these inmates in the park. There have been no instances of any problems on any of these projects? There have not been any. Okay. I will say this, you're, you're very lucky to have Chief Pickering as your police chief. Uh, I respect him. Uh, I consider him uh, a professional and I would make him aware of who's here and welcome uh, the random inspection of the work site by his officers uh, as an added covenant uh, to our work agreement. And what hours of the day would these inmates be on the project? Daytime. Usually we like to get them out to work by 7 in the morning. And back by what time? 3. Back by 3. Unless so the job requires some different uh, hours. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to, uh, Sheriff <clears throat> Yon, I wanted to add my support this program. Councilor Watson expressed very um, well my sentiments about how uh, projects have been done in seven communities, and it sounds like you've saved um, over $100,000 for the various communities involved, and I, I think it sounds like a good program, and I think since everybody's going to be gone out of the park by three, I mean, the prisoners will be gone, that I don't even think most kids would even see uh, the prisoners, so I, I support the program. Thank you. On the other hand, it might be important for young people to see prisoners in the course of rehabilitation doing work, community work, so. They, they'd be hard pressed to recognize and yeah. give them what they were. <laughs> I think they would. Uh, Councilor Barry. I'd like to make a motion that uh, the, uh, the council authorize the town through the manager to participate in the community projects program of the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> Councilor McGinty. I would only add that if, if that the, the town manager keep us fully informed of any project that may be coming up if he, if he wants to engage in case um, we have some concerns about that it may, may or may or not be um, appropriate for an area or a neighborhood or something like that, that just we, so that the council be aware of those things. Okay. Councilor Fritz. Um, I just, I, I have some reservations about the program to, um, I'd, before we really engaged in some of these things, I'd like to see the manager talk to some of the other towns that have participated and see how things went specifically, whether there were some things that they would have changed or done differently with the program. I had some discussion with um, some people at RWS where they have used prison, um, imp uh, not employees, in prisoners, um, to work there, and I mean, they, they were people who did come every day. I mean, they, they, that was a good part of the thing is they, had, they knew they were going to show up, unlike um, some of the workers they have now. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it was expressed to me that, that in many cases, the reason prisoners are, are where they are is that they have bad judgment and don't realize the consequences of their <coughs> behavior. And I'd like to be very sure that they're not put into situations of work where they might make bad judgments and get hurt and we would end up with liability problems. And I think re-roofing might be one of those situations. I, I'm not sure that's a wise choice of projects. The other suggestion of um, working on some Greenbelt trails Sounds very good, but that also seems like a situation that might be setting up for, I don't know, escaping into the woods sounds very easy. So I, I just like to rethink some of the projects we've talked about um, that have been mentioned. I think I'll ask the sheriff to respond to, um, I guess, your, your, your concerns about the liability uh -huh. issue uh, and or the town manager, I guess, whichever one of you wants to take that. And, um, I, yeah, do you have, 
Mark. Madam Chairman, I think I need clarity on the liability question. I think she was uh, asking that if a prisoner were to become injured because he was doing a risky kind of job, such as a roof job, then the liability with, with the mine. Time. In that sense. <laughs> and then I'll go to Councilman Barry and have him approve the expense. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm so going to cut his budget on the county. <laughs> so I think the pressure is duly applied left. Um, really, in all honesty, um, I appreciate your concerns about the potential for escape. It doesn't happen. Um, I appreciate your concern about the type of work they do, and I, I would invite you to go to the Church of the Holy Spirit. They uh, engaged in historical restoration there. They did carpentry work that left me in awe. Uh, yes, men do go to jail, and women too, for bad judgment, but these are individuals that have participated in a screening process that at least gives us some hope. They're on the road to start making the right kinds of judgment. Uh, they want to go to work. And I have a lot of tradesmen uh, who are in jail because they don't manage alcohol or relationships very well. Uh, they're not evil, they're criminal, uh, and they've been sanctioned accordingly. Uh, but evil is not what I'm afraid of. Uh, if they have access to the things that help them make bad judgments, then you and I share a fear, but they don't have that on the work site. I'd just speak briefly on liability and safety, and it, it's particularly touching this week. Uh, you know, a week ago, Yesterday, we had, a, we had someone, first person, that's ever died accidentally on town property. You know, really a tragedy with the, the cliff down at Fort Williams. And you know, we, we look very seriously at safety and not only you know, the workers, but everyone on, on all of our properties. And uh, you know, whether they're inmates or someone visiting from California or, or a town employee, you know, we're going to maintain the very highest rigorous standards. And ensuring that no one gets into any situation that, that is dangerous, and you know, particularly after last week, we're even ramping that up more to uh, to ensure that you know anyone who's on town property or doing any work for the town uh, uh, is fully safe. Uh, Councilman Fritz, just to add to your thinking on this, the inmate that poses any possibility, just that little bit of stomach discomfort that you may not be sure they should be out in the general community. Yet, they're appealing to you to participate in the program. We retain them on campus to do the work in and about the sheriff's office and on the grounds. And there's very little supervision there other than visual checks. Uh, we allow them the opportunity uh, to prove themselves. Uh, believe it or not, they work very hard to get to that status where they can go out on a field crew. Uh, they're not randomly selected by any means. Councilor um, Watson. Madam Chair, I have a question for um, Manager McGovern. Do we have any plans at all of um, promoting or advertising the fact that we are going to be using these inmates at, on, during certain days within the park, within the Cape Courier article or any other, no, other we, way? We generally don't do that for okay. reasons of the, the Sheriff's Department concerns of not wanting these folks to have visitors yes. uh, okay. coming onto the scene. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty evident when someone comes along with you know, their vehicles of, you know, who's there and what's going on. But okay. Generally, we don't advertise it in advance. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, for one, very supportive of this. I appreciate the information you give us. I've also asked the student representatives, because we've made some comments here today about the, how, what, what our youngsters might think of the program and how they might respond to it. And Rebecca has a, agreed to make some comments. So give us at least her thoughts about, but you'll have to go up there because nobody can hear you over there. Well, it's only us that's here, but nobody can hear you if you go there. And Rebecca had some thoughts, I think, maybe, on, uh, on the program. Um, I think this is a really good idea, only because uh, I've done debate for the past four years of my high school career, and my freshman year, our topic was reducing juvenile crime in the United States. And although it had to do with juvenile crime and not um, adult crime, uh, our, our plan or our policy was to have um, the juveniles do a sort of rehabilitation program that included doing community service work. And we found a lot of evidence that supported this sort of rehabilitation. It said that it gave the, um, the students um, increase in confidence and a, a sense of community so that when they did actually go and fact in the community, they were much more 
um, aware and supportive of their surroundings, and they were less likely to actually be reinstituted in, inside the jail or the detention center, or whatever it was they had attended. And I understand this is with adults and not with juveniles, but I think the same, it would work either way with adults as well. And I, I wouldn't fear personally for my safety in the park with them working on the building. And um, as long, I, I thought your comment was very, um, a, a legitimate one about our liability. And I thought that the answer was, the sheriff gave us was a very valid one. I thought it made sense. So I really like this idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that's a very good answer and a very thoughtful, and it's also based on your past experience. So that's very good. Now, is there a motion on the floor? Yes, yes sir. Sir. It's been second. Uh, are we ready to move the question? All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. It carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca, too, for your comments. Um, item number 31. Considera consideration of a recommendation from the Zoning Board of Appeals for applicants for setback reductions or variances to provide to the board a sketch plan from a registered main surveyor. I, I assume you've all seen these in your uh, agenda notes. And we're going to ask Hank to make a brief you know, comments. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, I'm Hank Warren, chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I'm not sure what's in your packet, but this uh, issue started actually several years ago when the board decided that it was going to require as a, a minimum requirement for all submittals that, in, that uh, involve decisions of variance or, or set, uh, setback, uh, a minimal plan that could assure us that the applicant uh, knew what they were doing on the land. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times we found that People, particularly on older, smaller lots, uh, have not ever had a survey. They've had only perhaps a minimal uh, evaluation for a so-called uh, D in the mortgage inspection plan uh, just in order to get their mortgage. And uh, so we started requiring that as a minimum of all applicants, and there were no objections. It's made an improvement, but the board has been concerned in the last uh, four or five months that we're still from time to time getting uh, inaccurate uh, uh, surveys or inaccurate plans in front of us. And we've had more than one situation where a building actually encroached on not only the uh, setback area, but on a neighbor's lot line, and the garage had to be sliced or moved, uh, corrected in that particular case. And uh, some of the board members, particularly those with expertise in this area, are, have been uh, quite concerned about it. So we discussed it a number of times and finally came up with a recommendation which was set forth in a cover note from Bruce Smith to uh, Mike McGovern on August 16th. And I believe you also have a copy of uh, a supporting letter from Jim Fisher at uh, Delaria Associates which I won't bother to get into in any detail, but which explains the variety of alternatives that are out there in the field for how to improve the quality of the plans that come to the town. And uh, the recommendation that we would like to make to the council is that, number one, we be able to upgrade our requirement uh, from the Class D survey that we're now requiring, which uh, Cost-wise, is about $100, give or take 25 depending on the uh, particular situation, to the more typical uh, and better situation, which is uh, called a sketch plan, uh, which falls somewhere between the, the Class D survey and a Class A survey, which is the whole nine yards, uh, in which uh, in a Class A survey, everything is done uh, looking through historic records and then work out on the land. We feel that the, uh, the middle level sketch plan, which is outlined primarily on page two of uh, Jim Fisher's letter, uh, would solve most of the problems we're bumping into and uh, come in at a cost that's uh, reasonable for the kind of situation, which is typically about $400. Uh, one of the, the remaining catches is what happens if in a particular un, and usually an un, unusual situation that's still not adequate 
And at that point, the board uh, suggested that we would have the authority to be able to require a full class A survey. Uh, since that would cost anywhere between $1,500 and $2,000, that's clearly something you would not want to do very often, and uh, hopefully uh, it wouldn't be necessary, except in a rare exception. Uh, the alternative probably is to decide that the survey or the information that we have in front of us is inadequate and just deny the variance. So uh, I would be glad to answer any questions you have. Bruce Smith, the, the code enforcement officer, is here if you get over my head. And uh, hopefully the council will uh, support this idea. The, the board felt it wasn't appropriate for us to, in effect, ratchet up uh, or tighten down, if you want to put it that way what we've been doing since the costs involved here without the council being aware of it and, and supporting our efforts. Thank you, Hank. I, I think there might be some questions from the council. <clears throat> yes, Councilor Roberts. More of a comment than, I, than a question, I guess. I had a refinance done to put an addition on my house at one point. I did the Class D. And prior to having that done, I had strung some string between a couple of pins and put three or four pins down along a 500-foot property line. Those showed up on the Class D survey. So that really is not adequate to define where somebody's property is when, when they, they put my pins to show where the property lines were. I mean, they were accurate, and I pulled the string pretty tight, but just the same. Well, to be fair, Class D is really not intended for that purpose, and, uh, uh, but there is a tendency to rely on it because most people have one if they got a mortgage, most of us do, and, uh, and secondly, because it's relatively inexpensive. and. Uh, but we just we can increasingly have found it in that, find it inadequate for our purposes. The only, the only question I did have was, how often do you think the $1,500 survey would be required based on your experience in the past? He's asking for the $400 one, though. No, I mean, but no, they, no. They, he was well, talking about the larger one that they might want to go well, occasionally. Uh, I think that's the rub, because it's hard to put a number on that. I, I can't think of only one situation <laughs> in the two and a half years I've been on the board where I might find something like that appropriate. Uh, and as I said, well, my view of it is that it should happen not at the discretion of the code enforcement officer, but only when the full board considers the reason for it, uh, if there's any question at all on the part of the applicant. Uh, if you had a commercial or uh, industrial type of activity, which is not something you'll find very often in this town, uh, you would expect to have that anyway. Uh, but for typical residential use, you would not expect to find it very often. I can't put a number on that, I'm sorry. All right. Councilor McGinty. Was there any negative reaction from the board on this issue at all? You mean board members who were opposed to the idea? Mm -hmm. uh, help me out, Bruce. I don't remember any, but I don't believe so, no. uh, we have on the board uh, both a construction expert in Joe Fristashi and, uh, and an attorney uh, and uh, several other board members with you know experience in the development field generally. and. Uh, it was several of them who were pushing for this improvement because they were getting upset that we were shirking our duty in a way by not being able to assure the neighbors, let alone the property owner, that what we were approving was in fact uh, not only legal, but not encroaching on somebody's prerogatives. Yeah, thank you. Co Councilor Watson. Hank, is there any other... Um I was looking at this at four, the four hundred dollars cost for the sketch plans about a almost a three hundred dollar increase over what they're currently doing, and the only time they if I've read this correctly, the only time that you would ask them for to go to the additional expense of a fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar survey is if they cannot find the pins or are there other circumstances where you would also ask them to get a full blown survey uh, that's true, and that's why it wouldn't happen very often i don't think there's there's almost always uh, I'm told. I have no expertise in this field, uh, trust me, so I'm speaking here from what I heard at board meetings, uh, that almost always these, this middle level thing, which is a relatively new concept in the survey field apparently, uh, is, a, is a, uh, an adequate approach for the kind of thing that we're doing. Okay. It may not be adequate for some other municipal purposes or other regulatory purposes, but for our purposes, in the vast majority of cases, we would expect it to be adequate. And that's why I suggested that as a board policy, if, if the council were agreeable to this, I personally would ask the board to 
uh, not place that responsibility or that blame if it comes to it on the code enforcement officer, but to offer the applicant the opportunity to come in front of the board and explain uh, what their situation is, why they think that's not appropriate, so that that cost is not borne as a matter of just willy-nilly. Okay. Thank you. Councilor swift -Gata. Um, I have a question for Mr. Warren. I, I want to make sure I understand um, exactly what the proposal is from the zoning board. Is it that there would be no circumstance anymore for um, people who are applying for a variance or setback reduction? You would never be using this $125 um, Class D survey, the mortgage, what's it called, the mortgage inspection uh, plan. That would just be gone. So basically the only two options would be the the $400 sketch plan or the full-blown plan? Uh, yes, or except that keep in mind this is only situations where you have a, a, what amounts to a setback encroachment, either a variance requirement or some other similar issue. Uh, there are other things that we do that that wouldn't be necessary. But for people who are applying for a variance or, or a setback reduction, it would be the, the new that would be the the $400 That's correct. sketch plan in all cases? Yes. That would be the, the bottom, the baseline, if you will. How many uh, such situations, I, I have no idea how, how many such situations the zoning board runs into, how many cases you see of this type a year? Uh, I don't have approximately. This. Pardon me? Yeah, I was going to say, Maybe Maureen five. McGovern. I mean, wait, there we go. Now you got me doing this. Maureen or Mayor. Stand up and give us a song. Maybe she'll sing a song. Uh, uh, Maureen and Bruce, at the request of the planning board, uh, had recently done a, an analysis of our last three years of, uh, of actions, uh, in part because we were working on another problem relating to variances, which we think needs to be addressed by the council and it's going through the process now. Uh, and uh, so we got, for the first time, really, we've had a, you know, a handle in front of us. I don't have those numbers with me, but I'm told it's about between uh, three dozen and 40 okay. a year that we're currently handling. And, uh, and of those 35 or 40, I know it may be hard to generalize, but how many of those would you say that the, um, the cheaper plan, the mortgage inspection plan, was insufficient for? I'm trying to get a gauge on how frequent a problem. This well, is. I understand where you're coming from, and I'm, I'm embarrassed that I didn't sit down with those numbers and look at them, and I'm not sure that would have helped answer the question. All I can say, I guess, is that I can't answer your question with numbers, but there's been an increasing uh, amount of discomfort on the part of board members over the last uh, six to eight months or so about the quality of what we're seeing. And in several cases, we have chosen to table applications and send them back to do more homework and provide better quality plans. Not only uh, better quality survey work, but also better quality in terms of size and detail of, of the plan showing that uh, the issues that we're trying to, to grapple with. Uh, what I'm trying to get. I'm, I'm guessing half, but that's, you know, I emphasize the word guess. Yes, I understand. Yeah. What I'm trying to get at here is it is a, a significant percentage increase. It may not seem like a lot in dollars to a number of people, but it is a, it's $125 up to $400, and for perhaps 40 people a year, that would mean a significant increase. And I'm trying to balance that versus the problems that are um, resulting from not using this better quality of plan, this more accurate plan. So the well, I think there, there are three uh, impacts from failing to do something the right way, and I'll be the first to admit that, that clearly, in some cases, the current situation is, is okay. Uh, but the three impacts are to the board and the difficulty of making uh, its decisions. The, the second impact is to the uh, adjacent property owners, of which there might be two or three or, or four for that matter, uh, and which in some cases may be the town, since right-of-ways are often the setback uh, point that we're working with. And the other impact is on the property owner that's submitting the application because if they choose, if they don't, for whatever reason of their own, do a more detailed survey, uh, they stand at risk of having their, uh, number one, their plan turned down for some reason, or, but more importantly, they, they stand at risk of building something that later will come back to be either a legal and or a financial problem because of the corrective action that's necessary. So uh, having tight boundaries, I, 
this happened in South Portland as an example, and I, I, I hesitate to use it, but it came up in another context of um, literally a multi-million dollar home along the water that uh, was moved back into an encroachment with a setback and uh, ended up in a lawsuit, which uh, the court upheld the requirement to, in effect, dismantle a portion of the house to clean it out of the setback area. Uh, and I don't think in that case that the plan was a problem because of the cost of the house, I'm sure it was well done, but those kind of things do happen, and we've had it happen in Cape Elizabeth to, some, to a lesser extent, not multi-million dollar homes. But, so in that sense, uh, my view is that it's a reasonable investment for someone who's spending tens of thousands to add on or, or construct a facility on an undersized lot. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. <clears throat> Mr. Warren, if somebody is looking for a variance from the street line, would they really need to pay that $400 survey? Or could, on that way, it's pretty obvious to be able to measure back from the middle of the street. You know, we have a 10 feet or 6 feet or whatever that they may be contesting. And the other thing, concern that I have was that the, uh, oftentimes the neighbors are not contesting. Uh, everybody's in agreement that this works fine, but it's just the regulations that say you can't do it. Do they, would, would they also need to go this extra money? Or could we perhaps implement a three-tier type of a, a schedule where something that's uncontested, um, it's very obvious that it's not a problem, and then go up in the, with a degree of difficulty as to type of survey that you'd want? Uh, I think the board would certainly be open to that possibility. The problem, of course, like anything where you uh, have judgments to be made is who makes them and, and what uh, difficulty. Uh, I would feel comfortable personally making, if you chose to go that way, making the code enforcement officer responsible for that first jump uh, and looking at the specifics of the situation. But then, as I said earlier, not, not going to the major jump without the full uh, zoning board being aware of it and responding to any objections from the applicant. Uh, and uh, to answer your question, uh, I don't know. I, I would. It would be the first time I've ever lived in or worked in in all the years I've been in Maine that didn't have or that had perfect uh, right-of-way <laughs> locations uh, to serve as a starting point for a setback. And with all the, the tiny roads and small lots in Cape Elizabeth and some of the older parts of town, which is where all the problems come from, uh, I'd be astonished if, if Mike could stand up and say that we had a perfect uh, right away line for every road that we own. Yeah, that's true. And, and let me just add, by the way, that there are a lot of private rights away. In I live in one of them, and uh, I'm sure there are others. Uh, I've looked at my own Class D survey, which is all I've got, and, uh, and it scares me uh, to know what would happen if I had to, to uh, defend the right away. Uh, so. Hank, I'd like to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> when you get a surveyor for the big $1,200 one, you get a licensed surveyor, who, what is the criteria for the person who does this smaller one, the $400 one? Is that also a licensed surveyor? Uh, or is it some other level of draftsman or something? No, I think we would be looking for somebody with a surveyor, with a professional seal, let's put it that way. Yeah. And normally you expect that to be a surveyor. I'm not sure whether a professional engineer, I don't know enough to know whether a professional engineer would be able to sign off on something like that. But if they did, presumably it would be based on some personal knowledge or somebody they had on their staff and had the capability of, of uh, finding those points and being able to set an outline. But I, I'd be the first to be admitting my ignorance in that. And if somebody has got a better idea, why tell me, please. It does need to be a registered land survey are registered in the state of Maine. Uh, civil <coughs> engineers, uh, most of the time, you know, get their own, either get their own certification as a registered land surveyor or hire some. We have had instances before where a civil engineer or some sort of engineer has claimed that they could do one, but we looked in, into it and, in fact, they weren't registered. So for the protection of the town, if you're going to require uh, something, you want to make sure they have the professional liability and the professional certification if you are going to require it at all. I have a couple of just sort of general concerns where I, I realize the good faith that the board has brought this forward since you're the ones who deal with these issues and I, I surely do not in, in my job. I'm concerned about the timeliness uh, 
if I were to be adding on a, a, a garage thing and I could get that drawn, to get a surveyor now is months away. I mean, they're just so booked solid. So I, I just wondered about the timeliness of it. I am a little bit concerned also about the cost. I, I really do feel that that's uh, quite a jump if I was doing it. And yet I'd like to think that there would be something that the board could use in some discretion where some jobs or some, some issues brought to you, you wouldn't need to use that sort of thing. And yet I think if you have a rule where you up there are using your own discretion as to who has to abide by it and who doesn't, that that would be a real problem. Uh, well, and yet I can't see that every single plan that comes to you is going to have to need the, the 400 one. Uh, that, that point was made earlier and, and I can see that that's the case and I think uh, Perhaps that leads to the question uh, of can we come up with some criteria for how you would jump from one to two to three or from A to B to D. Uh, and, uh, and since Bruce, but from my perspective, would be left making the first level of decision, which would be the vast majority of them, subject to the board's review, then uh, I would be conferring with him at some point here to get some ideas for how we might do that. Uh, and come up with some criteria, and I'd be glad to have, have that information come back to the council if that would make you feel more comfortable and you wanted to table this, table this issue tonight. Uh, but certainly, the reason the board brought this to you is because we're aware that this is going to be a sensitive issue to some people, and uh, we would rather have the political side of the table take care of some of the kind of questions that you're raising, and they're, they're good questions. So Do, You're smart to bring it to us and let us fill the bag for it. Huh? Yeah, that's right. It's called shifting the blame. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so My basic thought is to shift it back to you as soon as we uh, can. So I hear. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask Andy, uh, who has some questions also concerning these uh, issues. Well, you could just stand probably right there by Council Watson's microphone, and then you could be heard. Um, I'd just like to know if there was any ballpark on how often a $400 survey would be done and then an additional like $2,000 survey would be needed. You mean it wouldn't be enough at four, then you have to jump right. up like to the other one? Right, if you found out there was a problem in the survey that you'd have to go up another notch, like how often that would happen? Well, I think the issue is, is not so much whether uh, we think there's a problem with, with the middle level survey, the so-called $400 survey but rather whether the surveyor is unable uh, to find what they need out on the ground so that they can put their name behind that middle level survey. If they can't do that, then they're gonna to have to go back to their client, in this case the applicant, and tell them that they can't find the points out on the ground and there's not enough history for that area or for the surrounding pieces of property for their, they, to get a starting point so they can begin to develop uh, the sketch plan. And in that case, then the client will have to decide what they want to do, and uh, they either take a chance with an inadequate filing, or they come to the board if that's what they feel they need to do, and spell yeah. out their problem and see if they can get away without it. Yeah, and because that's a lot of money to have to be putting away and not be sure about it. So, like, mm. wouldn't it be just better off to be sure about it and then just go to the like highest level, or uh, and I. Uh, sure that there would be examples when it wouldn't be necessary. But. Well, again, I think the sketch plan, as Bruce whispered to me or reminded me a minute ago, is that the sketch plan is something that a surveyor will stand behind. It's not a question of sureness. Uh, but if they can't find what they need to do something that they can stand behind for a sketch plan, then they're going to refuse to do that, and the applicant will be left with a choice of probably of not filing for a variance or of moving up a step to the next highest level, which is the more expensive uh, version. And that's a cost question, uh, and it may be a, a question that, uh, depending on how much they're spending on the project, if it's a $200,000 project, then an extra $1,500 is probably not much money. If it's a $10,000 project, it's a lot of money, and you have to rethink that, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Fritz. I'd just like to ask the um, code enforcement officer if if he felt comfortable or whether there were some ways that we could do some level of judgment in, in your offices before it got to the board? No, I don't think there is. I don't know that I could make that call from one particular application to the next because it, it makes no difference whether it's side, rear, or front. Without, without some documentation to go by, whether, whether they be pins in the ground or something from the GPS, 
or, or, or some other means to get there, nobody can determine that up front. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if we require the sketch plan to, of the applicant, he went to have it done, there wasn't enough documentation, the surveyor could not put his name on that, the surveyor would then advise the customer, well, you can either get a full-blown survey or, or nothing, because we have nothing more to offer to you. And that's the, that's the cases where it would become a necessity. If they can't find documentation and they won't stand behind the sketch plan, then you've got to move to the other thing anyways, because there's nothing they could submit by going the other way. So that's why we feel that that midpoint, because they'll stand behind that document, that everybody's safe in what they grant to the applicant. Anyway. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that, um, that the zoning board uh, upgrade the requirements uh, by allowing a sketch plan by a registered land surveyor where uh, when an official pin can be found, and if the pin cannot be found, then uh, the requirement would be a, a land survey. Um, you need a second. I hope that clearly states what, what you were asking for. Uh, again, I'm not sure I know enough to say that a pin can be found. I'm not sure that's where I would, the way I would word it. Uh, adequate information to that a surveyor and stand behind a sketch plan based on adequate information from research on the ground and in the records, which includes the county registry and uh, other deeds in the area. Madam Chairman, could, could we ask for a draft motion? Would that be sure, helpful be from helpful. the board? Um, we could certainly do that. We have a couple of options here. We can certainly make a motion as best as you could describe it. If it's acceptable to everybody, they can vote yay or nay. We have another option, of course. We could send it back to the, the board and ask them to firm up uh, either the motion and or right. I, I would like to see some criteria. Um, we have several options. So we have a motion on the table. Is there a second to that motion? Hearing no second, that fails. Is there any other motion? I make a motion that we send this back to the zoning board for um, a, a listing of criteria for e the, either the sketch plan or the survey so it's clearly delineated for our taxpayers and people coming before the board as to what it is they need to do, how much they have to pay for each, each instance. I'd like to see it um, tabled and then brought back to us maybe for the October meeting. So. And can I assume that would include a proposed motion for somebody to offer? So it's yes. In writing. Yes, including a motion to offer. Second. I, second. I hear a second out there. Any more discussion? Councilor McGinty. I'd like to see some, some of the statistics to back up. I'm, I'm interested in this three-tier option, quite honestly, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it gets ratcheted up as needed. Um, you know, I understand what you're, what you're trying to do, but by the same token, I think if, if they can get away with a mortgage survey and it, and it works and you can live with it, that they have that option. If not, then we, we move up. And I'd like to see some statistics to kind of maybe back that up and why, you know, in, in all the, the issues that you handle, um, what percentage you could live with this or you couldn't live with that. The, the biggest problem with a mortgage inspection plan is that there's not a surveyor out there that wants an applicant to use this for anything more than the purpose of a mortgage. mortgage. So they won't even come and do it if they know the real reason why the applicant is, is uh, requesting this. Okay, but, but let's say I already have it. I'm refinanced or something. I got it. Now I want to do something. And, you know, I got it sitting there. I paid for it the first time around. Right. If it's adequate for me to use, I mean, if you can live with it, you know, and we talk about, you know, rights away and all that, I understand all the issues involved here. But what happens but, is when they do a mortgage inspection plan, it's just to, as, as, as the memo says, it's just to locate, the, build it on the lot and, and, and realize that there's no setback uh, violations. Um, what happens is an applicant takes that same drawing and he scales from the side of the building to the property line and he puts that measurement on there. It happens every time. He has no, no reason to believe that that's accurate or not because he hasn't gone out and found the pins himself. He's relying too much on something that's not even made for that purpose. So maybe it's better to to require him to go out and actually walk the property lines, but then he's still going on, on arbitrary points. 
and and so it's 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 real frustrating for for all of us to try to deal with something we know could be a major problem. But, but you've been doing it. We've been doing it, and, and, and we've had people having to actually cut garages in halves and move them over. Well, I guess that, what I want to know is how often does that happen? I mean, what, it doesn't is, happen that often, probably 15 to 20 percent of the time. Well, you but know, it happens. 20, 20 percent, I would say, is though, if, you're, if you're saying, I mean, it's two or three percent, then. I mean, they don't cut garages in half, but they come back for after the fact. They've already <laughs> gone through the whole process, and they come back, and they're, and they're looking at something that's too close to the line by two or three feet. And, and then what do you do? Can, at well, that can, point? can you give me some figures that, that show that? Show me that 15 or 20 percent. I mean, it, well, it, you it, can go through the records, uh, but I'd have to I mean, go back quite a ways, probably. It may be, you know. Let's take a look at that, see what we can do, and see if there's a way, and I'm not sure there is, but see if there's a way to think three tier. Uh, because if you're going to do that, you do have to have some sort of criteria that are going to be consistent for everybody uh, and not arbitrary. So that's where we have a bit of a problem. And I'm, I'm not sure how to approach that, but we'll just talk to it and see where we come up. Uh, we have, we're, we're in the, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that there's a motion on the floor and we're still in the discussion process. Uh, Councilor swift Kayata, Councilor Berry. Has that been seconded? The yes, the motion has been seconded, yes. I understand uh, the issues that this presents for you, and it's a difficult job that you both have as code enfor enforcement officer and also on the zoning board. Um, I think my concern is that we would be charging everyone who comes to apply a, an increased fee, the $400 fee, so everyone would be bearing sort of the cost of this increased accuracy. I have no concern personally with um, if someone decides to get a, a a cheaper sort of survey and they take the risk that they don't have a real accurate survey and then they have to move their garage well they could have they're bearing the risk and they're going to have to pay for moving half their garage over or whatever it's not an ideal situation obviously and we don't want that to happen but I'm concerned that we're sort of transferring the the, the cost of this survey onto the backs of everybody who may not have a problem with their own property or not and so for that reason I think that it would be good to table this and, and put it uh, back to, to you guys to see if we could get some more information that would help us make a more informed decision. Let me just uh, be explicit though. You use the word fee, which is not accurate. It's, it's a I, cost. I misspoke. Yeah. I know it's a, it's a survey, but it's, since it would be almost required by, by the town if they wanted to go for a variance, it's, it's not a fee, but it's something that they'd have to pay to, to try and get their variance. Sure. So it would be an increased cost for all proposed uh, consumers, I guess you could say. Councillor Barry? Oh, that was. Oh, okay. Madam Council Chair, one, one last question, and it um, goes to Bruce. Having the sketch plan versus the mortgage inspection, from your perspective, code enforcement, does it, t does it require less of your time to review a project for a sketch plan than it would for a mortgage inspection in terms of what you have to do? Is there a cost savings in terms of your time by having more no, accurate information? No, but I, I intend to get something that's drawn to scale quicker from the applicant. <laughs> okay, but doesn't, there's no cost savings from your standpoint? Not really, no. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are we ready to move the question? Does everyone remember the question is that we are sending it? The motion is that we are, I don't have the exact words. Maybe would you like the clerk to read it back? Please. <laughs> if she has, in, ca in case she has the correct phrase here. From what I understand, this is being sent back to the Zoning Board of Appeals for proposed motion and criteria for a sketch plan versus a survey and to be returned to the Town Council at the October meeting. Is the October meeting, um, I mean, that's like two weeks away, so I don't know if you can do it in the October meeting. Um, all I can say is we'll give it our, our give it a try. And so well, maybe we can say by November, so that we can either be October or November. I think the issue is more than one of the research that Bruce would have to do in order to respond to the question that maybe. Councilor McGinney raised. I so. That's acceptable. <laughs> I would also like to amend the motion to also include any a review on your part, if on the zoning board's part, if you would like to uh, relook the mortgage inspection at being applicable on certain occasions. So I did not say that in my first motion, but if you want to take a look at the whole picture and come back to us, that's fine with my motion. That incorporates, I think, Councilor McGinty's concern for some sort of records of statistics. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want you to. Could I, could I yeah. make one comment? Yeah. We haven't 
been using the Morgan inspection plan as a requirement for more than a year. So some of the things that I find would not, not necessarily relate to the mortgage inspection. It might be a mortgage inspection. It might be a site plan drawn by the applicant. So we don't have documentation really to, to pinpoint the percentages because they haven't become problems yet because they may not have been resold or, or other things that would trigger a problem. Okay, we're ready for the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank I'm sure you. it was more complicated than you anticipated, maybe, but <laughs> there was some concern. Item number 32, action on nominations from the Appointments Committee to fill vacancies on town boards and commission. And uh, Councillor swift Adder is chairman of the, the um, Appointments Committee. Thank you. Um, the Appointments Committee met uh, in August, did interviews. Uh, we had many ac excellent applicants. Uh, the other members of the committee, uh, Councillor Watson and Councillor Roberts and I, interviewed. We, as I said, had many ac excellent applicants apply for these positions, especially for the Library Board and the Zoning Board. Uh, there were more board positions that are going to be opening up starting in January of 2000. So we will have a chance to consider again some of these fine candidates. So having said that, um, the, the, we recommend to the, that the council approve the following individuals for appointment for terms expiring uh, when I designate. For Arts Commission, for term expiring 1-1-2000, Rose Keneally. For Arts Commission, term expiring 1-1-2002, Kim McClellan. For Recycling Committee, her term expiring 1-1-2000, Deborah Braxton. And also on Recycling, her term expiring 1-1-2002, Maria Gallace. Gallus, I'm not sure I pronounced her name correctly, sorry. For Thomas Memorial uh, Library Board Trustee, for term expiring 1-1-2002, Dorothy Stack. And for Zoning Board of Appeals, for a three-year term expiring 1-1-2002, uh, David Backer. There are a couple of terms that expire 1-1-2000, and those terms um, will just carry over. They're basically going to, we will reconsider them, and I think we will reconsider them strongly since they will only serve two months. Um, and just so the public knows, that will not count as their, as a full term, so they would be able to serve two more full terms after that partial term. A second a motion. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. I just would like to extend my thanks to the others on the appointments committee and to also the applicants and um, who are willing to serve the town and to those people who were uh, just appointed. Congratulations. Item number 33, <clears throat> action uh, on nomination from the town clerk of a citizen to serve as chair of the voter registration appeals board. Town Clerk. Thank you very much. By State Election Law 21A, the uh, requirement for the Chairman of the Registration Appeals Board is that the mm -hmm. clerk recommends to the Council an appointment. I would recommend that Marion Holzhauser be reappointed to serve as a Chairman until September 29, 2003. Mm -hmm. I may add that this Board, um, when it came into existence four years ago, um, again by State Law, there has not been an appeal to the board, if a person is aggrieved by the decision of the registrar, they can appeal to the board. Um, however, if that situation ever presented itself, I would feel very comfortable <coughs> that uh, Mrs. Holzhauser would um, have invaluable input and leadership to that committee and would be very comfortable with her serving as a chairman. So Thank moved. You. It is, <coughs> we, she can't make a motion. We can only approve her nomination oh. by motion. Okay. I um, approve, recommend that we approve her <laughs> nomination. Second. <laughs> I'd like to have you make a motion, but. Did I say that? No, you didn't. Uh -huh. You didn't. You just recommended. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> item number 34 action on proposed clerical staffing levels within the assessing codes and planning office. Manager McGovern. Yeah, I'll give a very brief introduction and then ask Ms. O'Mara to speak to, on this item. Uh, it, it's a strong feeling in the ACP office, uh, and I've, I've reviewed it as well and agree with it, that the clerical demands in the office are, are presently at or near the capacity 
of the workers in the office, i.e., the, the demands are quickly projected to exceed the capacity. The primary reason that that's about to happen is the Cross Hill subdivision, which is about to get underway. Uh, when the budget was put together last spring, uh, that subdivision was dormant. We had no idea if it would continue or not. Uh, recently, as if you might have seen on Spurwick Avenue, it has, in fact, started construction. It is going to include uh, 90 new homes uh, over the next, over the time that those are built, which is not immediately, they will be generating approximately one half million dollars in building permit fees, electrical permit fees, heating permits alone. This is simply in construction related fees. It has nothing at all to do with the taxes that, that will be generated out of the, the subdivision. So over the next few years though, my sense is we'll take in, based on conversations with the developer, approximately $300,000 of the ultimately anticipated $500,000 in fees. And the concern is that we want to be able to meet all the questions, process all the paperwork, keep track of all the records in terms of those inspections. But even more so, we want to make sure that this doesn't gobble up the capacity that we're not dealing with all the other issues that come up every day as, as they do now. So basically what I'm asking for and what the office is asking for, and Maureen can give a lot more details, is a, an approximate annualized cost for this of $14,500. The actual cost during this fiscal year is around $8,500. This includes for the pay. It also includes for Social Security. It includes for uh, unemployment compensation and workers' compensation. There would be no health insurance uh, to this. There would be prorated vacation, as there is for any other employee. Uh, if we advertise for this position, it would not come on board until November or so. Uh, so it's not something that, that would happen immediately. Uh, I could go into a lot more details on exactly, you know, the need and what it entails, but uh, Maureen is here to, to do that uh, and answer any questions. Also, by the way, Bob Konzel in the back, our town assessor, tax assessor is here, Bruce Smith, as you've seen, and the other uh, two women uh, sitting next to uh, Bruce, Leslie Young, of the, uh, the member of the staff in the office, as well as Lois Morrow. Thank you, Michael, and I, I had to, I want to make sure that you understand that, that uh, they came tonight because uh, we've been talking about the levels of work in the office for several months now. Uh, our expectation was that things would settle down, that everything would get back to uh, a level that we could all handle, and uh, the fact that, that, that we're all here tonight is telling you that we're kind of coming to the conclusion that that's not going to work. Um, I guess what I would like to do very quickly is just explain what we're asking for. Right now, in our office, we have two full-time clerical staff positions. We have one full-time person who holds the position of office manager, and we have a second full-time position which is filled by two part-time people. Uh, we have always used that second position as two part-time people. I think we've been very well served with that arrangement. What we've been able to do is take advantage of the great amount of uh, quality of people in the town of Cape Elizabeth and hiring part-time people that uh, don't want to work full-time or are unable to work full-time or are not interested in working full-time. And I think we get very high qualified people for that arrangement. Uh, but our problem has been that uh, we're starting to suffer what I think is a real uh, problem with customer service. Our office has always placed that as a number one priority. We expect the phones to be answered on the second ring. We expect people to be able to get help at the counter immediately. We expect to be able to give people information about assessing records. Uh, we send out, we've, we've tried to collect some numbers today, and these are averages, but we're averaging sent, mailing out at least 300 notices every month. And some of those people that get those notices come into the office. They call the office and ask what kind of thing is happening on a particular meeting. They come into the office and they want to look at plans. We pride ourselves on having those plans available at all times, at making a place for people to look at them at their leisure, to be available to answer their questions, and to make copies of those plans if they need them. But all of those things take time. Um, what we're finding is with mailing out five to six agenda packages a month, 
Um, often what will happen is if I want to get someone to photocopy my agenda package for me, I have to watch the phones. Um, and that's happened not once, not twice, but many times. Uh, we have uh, several different computer software programs that we run in the office, and again, we pride ourselves on learning how to use those, on having several people available to learn how to use those, but it takes time to learn how to use those. Um, and what we found is, our hope was uh, that once everyone became trained, uh, everything would settle down, uh, a lot of these things would start moving together more rapidly, and the, the workload is such that, that um, we're just barely keeping up as it is. Uh, Hank Warren was, was here just before me, and he talked about uh, getting some information for you, some stats together about the cost of, of going with a different kind of survey. Uh, just recently, the zoning board asked to change the variance standard from the undue hardship to practical difficulty, and the planning board asked for the same thing. They said, well, how many variances do you get a year? Um, how would this change? Uh, how, what kind of variances are being offered? And we did go back through the records and do that study, and Lois Morrill did, did that work. Um, I asked for it about six weeks before we needed it, and I ended up having to stand over her uh, four o'clock, waiting for her to finish it, because we just didn't have time to get to it until the very last minute. And uh, we have staff people that are routinely staying well past the time when everyone else is left just so they can get the notices ready to go out the next day so they can get that study done that's been asked for a committee. So uh, why are we here now? We should have been here during the budget season. My answer is I've been asking myself the same question is I think we've all been taught and we've all been told that we should be doing a lot more with a lot less. And that was our expectation. We have been, over time, adding a lot of services in our office, and we've just added them in, and we've, in my opinion, basically hit the wall. Uh, we, we cannot continue to do the things that we have been doing unless we can find a way to get some more staff support. And uh, I thank the manager for analyzing the Cross Hill subdivision, because I think what he's done is he's tried to find a way to fund what we have as a real need. So I'd like to stop there and, and let you ask some questions. Councilor swift <clears throat> Um Ms. O'Mara, when was the last time you had an increase in staff to do I, these sorts of duties? I believe it was two and a half years ago when we combined the assessing and codes office and the planning office. And at that time, we had one full-time person who did support work for the assessor <clears throat> and partially for the building inspector. And then we had a person who was working 12 hours a week who was doing my work and some of the work for the code officer. Um, and from that time, we took that 12-hour position and we increased it to a 40-hour position. And we've been at that level for, I think, it's two and a half to three years. Longer than that. Okay. And you've had, have you had to resort to using overtime at times? Uh, we, we, we have on many occasions, and that's another benefit of having these two part-time people is uh, we've asked the person who's not working at that time if they'd be willing to come in. Uh, you would think they'd never see each other, and in fact, especially lately, they've been working together an awful lot. So uh, what we have typically done is, is ask the part-time person that's not working if they're available to come in. We've been very fortunate that they've been willing to move their schedules around, but they have families and other responsibilities as well. Okay, so basically, if I understand you correctly, this is a way to maintain the services, the customer services to the townspeople that you've been trying to provide in the past and you're looking at increased demands on you in the future and all this would be done within um, funds appropriated from undesignated surplus so there would be no extra, we're not approving any extra costs to, to the taxpayers for this year. And of course we could look at it in the regular budget process for next year, is that correct? Thank you. Ms. Chris, you have to keep in mind that during this budget time, since we met with our budget, not only has a situation like this arisen, but our, our income has, has risen considerably more than we anticipated when we were in the budget process. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor, who, who had a question? Councilor Watson, did you have a question? Excuse me. Um, I did. In terms of uh, Cross Hill, it's my understanding that phase one and two are going to kick in. There are five phases in this development over a period of between three to five years. Uh, 97 homes total, but upwards to 35 in phase one and two that are going to be open in the next, in for sale in the next 10 to days to two weeks. Um, based on what you know of 
issuing building permits, et cetera, for 35 more homes. How much more additional time does, do you anticipate that taking? Um, I was trying to get a handle on some of those numbers today, and I can't tell you how long it takes to process a building permit. I can tell you that uh, we were trying to figure out why is it that I end up alone in the office, because I really don't like that. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we figured out is we have three professionals, all of whom include job responsibilities outside of the office. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the code enforcement officer, because obviously he's not doing his job unless he's out there doing inspections. And we figured in between the five to six average inspections that he does a day, the five to seven people that he helps at the counter, and that's a 10 minute uh, average amount of time, the 20 odd phone calls that he takes every day, um, and those phone calls are not one minute phone calls, that he's probably averaging seven, that's seven hours right there of his time. Um, and so he is, he is not available for, for anything but just those issues. I'm not sure how he's going to issue more building permits. I'm sure he'll find a way to do that. Um, my problem has been that uh, we're, keeping, we're keeping up with the building permits, uh, but other things that, are, are not, that don't have to be done within the week are sliding. A concern I have is that we're looking at this part-time position. We're anticipating over the next three to five years, 97 houses. Uh, I understand you had an increased workload because of the homestead exemption, what you're doing for the zoning and planning boards, et cetera. Is a part-time position enough? Do we know enough information now to know that what we need to hire is a part-time person? Or come next budget time, what we really need to have done is we really need to hire a full-time person. And would we be better off looking towards temporary staffing where we don't have any additional overhead outside of the hourly nut until we figure out over the next six months what it is we need to have to be able to manage all of this workload. Mm -hmm. My concern is that we're re reacting to the Cross Hill development instead of really planning for all of these needs. And I'd like to feel more comfortable about the fact that we, in fact, know that three days a week is what we need. And uh, I'd sure like to see it worked into the whole budget versus come out of a uh, surplus. That's just my view. Yeah. And I'd like to see some kind of study that says, this is what we need, this is how much. And, and I wouldn't have any uh, qualms whatsoever about paying for a temporary staff two, three times a week until we know exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to promise you that uh, unless the manager tells us we're not to do it, that we will not be coming back with a budget ne next year that asks for a full-time position as opposed to 24 hours. Um, this may work for us. If it doesn't, we, we may come back and ask you for that. As for temporary help, uh, we recently had an employee that was on maternity leave. And um, uh, we're, we're adamant, adamant that we couldn't live 12 weeks with, without that second person. And so we pursued various options. And one of the things we did is we called a couple of temporary agencies and looked at what we could get for help. Uh, that was not our preferred option. We found that it was much cheaper to hire someone at the rates that we're currently paying our employees. Uh, we were looking at $15 an hour for a temporary agency. Uh, I think we've been extremely fortunate when we hire someone ourselves because we get a lot more value. In addition, uh, we're talking about an office that runs, I think right now we're running five different specialized types of software programs. And it's very important if we want to maintain our customer service that we get someone in there that we can do some training with. Um, and just hiring a temp who's able to, to answer the phone, I don't think we're going to be satisfied that that, that was a, a good use of our money. I would hope that at $15 an hour that we'd get someone that could do more than answer the phone. But the temp person only gets 6 or $7 an hour. Oh, I $15 that. goes to the agency. I understand that, but I also know that when we look at what we pay an hourly person and we add in vacation time, mm -hmm. unemployment compensation, and everything else, we're talking a significant amount, if you look at the whole hourly. <coughs> So that's just my view. Councillor Roberts. I guess to sort of piggyback on what Ruth had just said um, with a temporary type of a position, but I, I was thinking more in terms of if you have two part-time people now who are already up to speed, why wouldn't we be better off increasing their hours so that to, to make up the, the shortage of hours? And I guess my, and my second question was, where are you going to put them anyway? Good questions. First question, why don't we just increase the hours of these two extremely competent people we already have? 
already tried that. <laughs> Would very much have liked to have done that. Um, but both of them are happy with the hours they have. They're extremely productive at the hours they have, and they don't want to work anymore. Uh, so uh, when we discussed looking at getting a full-time person, my feeling was, why put all the effort into trying to hire someone when we have two very competent people already? Uh, your second question, I'm forgetting, but I know I had an answer to. Where are you going to put them? Where are you going to put them? We talked about that, too. Uh, after, after trying to appropriate space in other people's offices, we decided that uh, what we would do is uh, rearrange some of the space in our office. We would move our GIS system into what we now have as a printing closet where uh, we keep the printer. Uh, we built that closet for the printer because we used to print the tax bills on it. It was very loud. It would go on for hours at a time, and it was very disruptive. Now that we don't have to use that printer for tax bills, we think that we can empty out that closet and fit our GIS system in there, take the GIS space, and use that as a workstation. Councilor McGinty. Well, I'm confused. Um, I have Bob's memo here to Mike and Mike's memo to us. Who's telling the truth here? Um, is this, are we doing this because of the Cross Hill project, or are we doing this because of Bob's request? Why are we doing this? Uh, I think what the memos reflect is, uh, you know, Bob's view that there already is a problem, my view that I'm not convinced that there already is a problem. However, I can see a problem fast coming uh, within the next month, in fact, as, as the, the folks really start to come in to inquire about those different lots. And uh, I, my sense is it's the Cross Hill that's really the driving force. Otherwise, I'd say, come on, guys, wait until, wait until July. But I'm, I'm just not prepared there. But your, your comment that, you know, who are we to believe, I... Well, no, I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying it, it's all the, all the issues in, in Bob's memo, except the Cross Hill, are all things that were already in place prior to the budget process. Uh, the homestead exemption, all these other issues, the zoning ordinance, all those things are things that were already there, with the exception of Cross Hill. And, you know, should have been, if, if they needed more help, should have been put forward in the original budget process. I mean, we're only two months two and a half months into the new budget year. And my other comment is that I see this as the foot in the door for Cross Hill. Um, we need a, a, a clerk to work on their building permits. Are we going to need a new code enforcement officer to go up and inspect all these buildings? Are we going to need a, a, a part-time assessor to go up and assess all these buildings? I mean, where does this, what is the impact that Cross Hill is going to have on, on our services? Is this just you know, the camel's nose into the tent. That's, that's uh, my... Just, just to get a few, I guess, a few steps into the building inspector. The, we have a new building inspector. He's made a lot of changes. And uh, a lot of those changes have resulted in a lot of work. And there is a unanimous feeling in the office that that has been a big improvement. Uh, one of the examples I like, I really do believe this is a customer service issue. I think the manager has done an excellent job in finding a way to fund something without having, within the existing budget. Uh, but right now, all of the, the code enforcement officers' appointments are scheduled by the secretaries. Um, that wasn't the way it used to be done. Uh, they keep track of all the records. So when he does an inspect, and, and the thing is, you'd think an appointment would just be a 10-second thing. You flip open a calendar. In fact, it's almost a 20-minute process, because they enter it into a new computerized system, which calls up all the records for that lot that we have in the system. So there's a lot of work that he no longer has to do because they're doing more of it. And I think that's much more efficient. Um, should we have come forward before? Again, I, I've been asking myself the same question. Uh, we had a part-time person in our office uh, start. We had uh, uh, basically full staff up until March. Um, and everything looked like it was, it was fine. Um, but what's happened is we, we've been learning these new programs, and, and, the, and the, the hope was, the expectation was, that we would continue to do more with less, um, that things would settle out, we'd learn how to use these programs, we'd get more efficient, everything would come together. And I'm coming to the conclusion that the reason things aren't coming together is there's just too much to fit into a, 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 a hole that's just too small. Um, well, clearly, if, if you decide that we need to do what we have to do with the resources we have, we'll do that. Uh, my concern is that I don't think we're going to be able to pick up the phone at the second ring all the time. 
Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time doing that all the time now, and I think the fact that these two ladies are here are telling you that uh, they're running ragged uh, on days and staying till 5 or 6 o'clock because notices have to go out on that day. Uh, the one thing I promised to say uh, that I wasn't able to bring up is uh, the difference with our office is that if no one comes in on a certain day, if the phone does not ring once, we all have eight hours of work to do. And when the phone rings and people come in, that's just more time that uh, we expect to spend with people, and we still have work to do at the end of the day. Ed, I'd like to comment briefly on that, you know, we should have known in, in the budget, and the budget's only two months into the year. Uh, the departments, I think, were required to submit budgets by February 15th. So, you know, what we're really looking at is their planning back in January, as well as my overall emphasis, as Maureen has hinted at, that, you know, we're, we're very conservative as an organization when it comes to new positions. And, and, you know, if we had asked for the position in the budget, I think, you know, the council would have, you know, really given it a hard look and probably would have said no because you couldn't identify that one piece that really got that much busier. I think, you know, the unique thing about Cross Hill is, uh, you know, they are going to be, you know, buying services from us through the payments of the various fees. Uh, you know, this, I, I don't know the exact amount, how it will come out each year, but, you know, assuming over the next three years it's $300,000, this would cost about $24,000 over the cost of those three years. So, so you know, we're looking at $24,000 in additional expense for $300,000 in income. I think, you know, if, if any corporation, you know, in, you know, we all like to compare ourselves to companies and towns ought to be run like a business, you know, any business that wouldn't be willing to invest $24,000 to provide s service to a customer that's given 300000 in revenue, uh, you know, I don't think that business would survive too long. So I, I think it's a, it's a good investment, and I really appreciate uh, the concern that the office has for productivity and for customer service. Councilor Fritz. I, I'd like to understand a little better the, the Cross Hill progression of, of the development. Yep. Um, do they not have to put in the entire sewer line? before they can begin offering lots for sale and the road and I mean isn't that going to take considerable time no. and this is kind of anticipating a certain number of sales that we have no clue what it would be they can they can start offering lots for sale today uh, but that, but actual building, I mean, they aren't going to be able to connect any houses up to a non-existent sewer. The sewer is going in. They expect to uh, have everything completed by early December in terms of uh, the sewer line, the water lines, the, all of the roads and utilities in phase one and two. There'll be constructed roads. We probably will ask them not to put the final layer of pavement on because we we usually like to hold that off until a lot of the, the individual lots come in, but uh, they have posted in an escrow account $1.8 million to carry that out. They've already laid out the cash for it. They have a contract run to do it, and they've begun work. So uh, there's every expectation that everything will be done uh, by early winter, and there's no reason someone couldn't drive down that road and pick out their lot. And the market is, uh, you know, people are looking for house lots in Cape Elizabeth, and talking to Steve Parkhurst, who's the representative of the owner, uh, there's a lot of people lining up to buy those lots. So we expect a lot of activity. And, and before they're going to drive down the road, they're coming into our office to look at the plants. <laughs> so and they're, and they're, you know, so that, that, that process has already started for us. Madam Chair, one thing I'd like to comment on, Maureen, is um, I've been in and out of your office several times. And I have also been in and out of, out of the office of, at South Portland. Something that I think would save a great deal of time of these people is that if, as in South Portland, access to the files is available as you go in versus having to request that someone hand you a file. You know, when we're cleaning out the closet, maybe we should look at arranging the files in some way that 
the realtors, appraisers, et cetera, can have access to those files. In South Portland, they can look them up the numbers, they can get the file. They don't file them back because they're afraid someone will misfile it. They put them in a folder and every hour someone goes and files it. But I think that would be a tremendous savings in terms of time and would allow some expediencies. And I'd like to see us at least look. It may, may not be feasible in our existing space, but it's something I'd like us to take a look at because I think it could save some time just from getting up and down to get files for people. And um, the other thing I'm, I'm going to say is that I am not going to support this this evening. But that does not mean that I don't see the need for additional staffing. I do. What I would like to see you do is get some temporary staffing, give us an analysis of where we are once Cross Hill kicks in, and then and go into undesignated surplus and hire temporary people, but then give us some specific information and then hire maybe a full-time person in the next year's budget. I just want to comment briefly on uh, Councillor Watson's question regarding the records and handing them out. There are some towns that do that. I think it's been the past practice here to hand them out uh, to assure security for the records that we have, because these are public records. And um, there is a tendency for them to disappear, uh, most of the time inadvertently, you know, just people forgetting and putting them in, in their briefcases. And um, two hours later, two or three other people have come in to ask for a certain record, and it's, it's no longer there. So right. we've opted for this method. You're right. It does take a little bit more effort. Uh, in the short term, but in the long term, I think it helps us preserve the integrity of our records, and I think the planner could probably vouch for her records as well as this one. I, I, uh, <laughs> somebody who generally likes to talk, I've been under enormous control not to say anything. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I guess I pretty much disagree with everybody on the council. I, I, I feel, my personal feeling is, during this discussion, that we have been edging ever so close to micromanaging an administrative position that is not part of, I mean, the kinds of things we've been doing is suggesting how you should run your office, what you should do in your office. We don't run your office. I have no intention of running your office. All I know is that if the guys at the IGA get 400 new customers, they have to hire somebody new in the vegetable stand to keep it piled in so that they can have service. I, don't, I guess I just truly don't understand what the problem is. This is an office that's exploding in business. You're asking the same people to do the job. I can't understand why we can't hire somebody, train somebody. Instead of taking a temp, a temp that comes maybe six weeks, she's gone in three weeks, or he, and you've trained them. I, I, I guess I just don't understand that the efficiency, if our position is to offer service uh, to our citizens, and I personally have loved, in the 25 years that I've been a broker, coming into that office and saying, could you get me this file, please? It say, it's about half the time to go in and do that. But uh, I, everybody has their opinion. I personally am going to support this position. I don't understand. Nothing can stay the same for always, for a whole year. If this had been anticipated by this department, I would assume that they would have made this recommendation if you had been able to anticipate that this new development would go online and that you would be this busy. I personally believe that we've given good service all these years. I'd like to see us continue to do that. If we can do it with a part-time person, that's great. I assume that if we get that part-time person, if you come back, you'll make your case again in the spring for either a full-time or that this has worked out very well. I also want you to know that I think you made a great presentation. You had all the details and the information at your fingertips, and that's great when you have a busy office like that. So uh, my I, I will probably support this uh, position. Um, Councillor Barry. I would like to echo everything you just said and make a motion that we uh, support this position. I think that uh, I've worked with Maureen on two of the committees I've served on, and uh, she has an incredible amount of uh, just detailed work to do. I think she's very well organized. I share the same experience with Bob Consul and the ladies in the office, and I think that they, I'd just like to repeat what you just said without doing it twice. But I, I would move that we, uh, um, support the, uh, authorize the, what, expenditure of uh, the... It would be $8,500 for... $8,500, I was looking for the number here, yeah, $8,500 for clerical staffing within the accessing, assessing codes and planning office. Make that form of a motion. Okay, for a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? Yes, uh, <laughs> 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 Councilor Swift-Kayana, sorry. <laughs> I always wanted to be on that end so we wouldn't have this turning. 
I just wanted to correct any misapprehension uh, I may have, might have given other people on the council. I strongly support this. I was asking with my questions for the purposes of clarifying that I think this is a great way to maintain service without increasing taxes right. to the townspeople. And I do not, I also do not believe in micromanaging. And I think um, we will be well served in, in taking this step. I don't think that hiring a temp would be a good idea because I don't think you could get the quality person that you need. And um, I don't see any reason to hand money over to a temp company uh, to get someone of a lower quality of service. No aspersions on all those temps out there. but. Um, I, uh, I think this would be great, and so I support it strongly. I'd like to move the question. Well, we're, before we move the question, we're going to have a moment of discussion from one of our students, and probably it's just as easy to step up to oh, John, you had to step up to that speaker. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. I know you're all like, kind of like sick of discussing about this, but I just thought I'd share that your student representatives, both Annie and I, strongly support this, and um, it's partially because we both worked in a business, and we know how busy it can get working in one and needing extra staffing. I know working with Ruth at Oz that there were times when we needed extra personnel. I don't understand why when they're projecting $300,000 coming in and only requesting, well, they're only requesting temporary, but it was suggested to have full time, why we couldn't just support them and ensure our customer service to be as adequate as it is right now and to, and to continue having such good, good customer service. I, I, I've looked at your budget. I don't really know what, what's in it for it. I don't understand all that technical stuff, but just from a student's perspective, I don't understand why we can't do it. So we both strongly support it. Thank you very much, and we appreciate having your opinion. Council McGinty. I want to make it clear that I have the greatest respect for Bob and Maureen and Bruce and the employees. It's, it's not my point. My point is that, you know, this development is going to start costing us money. It's already going to cost us $8,500. We haven't got a single cent of taxpayer money. And to say that this isn't going to cost the taxpayers any money is wrong. If we take it out of undesignated surplus, that is taxpayer money. And it may not be designated for any particular function, still taxpayer money. And, you know, this is not a freebie. This is going to cost somebody something. And I really have a big concern about the subdivision um, going to continue to cost us money. And, you know, I just, with all the respect to Bruce, I just see him back here in a year saying I need some help. So, I think that's probably, it, it's true, and it probably, it, it certainly can be taxpayer money. Probably every subdivision we've built in this town in the last 60 years that I've been here has cost us money, and somewhere along the line, there's a, there's a pay-up time, and uh, it either comes in the police department, the rescue department, the fire department. If you're bringing citizens in, we pride ourselves in, pro in providing a community that meets the needs of citizens and a nice place for people to live. And in order to get their house here so they can live here, if this is what it takes, I continue to support it. And I, and I know that nobody was being critical of the department. I was just holding myself from speaking while you were all talking. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> now, that's, it has been, oh, Councilor Roberts. I might as well weigh in also, I guess. <laughs> I, it was I a micromanaging some, comment that got everybody going. <laughs> nah, you were right. I, uh, I just had some reservations. I didn't feel that the information in the packet was really adequate to justify the position originally. I think most of my questions have been answered. Um, I will support it, but I would have preferred to see it go to workshop first. Workshop? We could have discussed some of these issues rather than wasting all the time. Oh, I think it's great to have it discussed here. Then the public gets to hear it. <laughs> Do they want to? Well, that may be another question. They can turn it off. I, I just have to weigh in as well, I guess. I, I have to agree with um, John's comments that this isn't, isn't a freebie. Developments always cost taxpayer money. It's never increasing the property base, their property tax base. I, I have a lot of reservations about having this position when we really don't know whether this Cross Hill development is, is going to be bringing in that much activity. It, it probably will, but I kind of am not sure that the economy, I, I don't understand how the economy can keep going like it is. Um, um, but I, I also appreciate how much the planning office does. I mean, I, I am on some committees that where Maureen serves as staff, and um, I kind of don't agree that we should be asking for them to go through the files again on the other <laughs> issue, <laughs> because that's just asking for them to do a lot more. I mean, how many hours of work is that going to take? A lot. Um, this is really, I mean, I really think it should have been at budget time. 
I, I don't think we should be always dipping into undesignated surpluses because we have some public safety buildings and public works buildings and we had to raise the taxes this time even though we had a lot coming in on more excise taxes because people were buying more cars. I, I just um, get rather upset over <laughs> constantly increasing our budget and, and I don't think that Cape Elizabeth over the, this last number of years has seen the kind of development other towns have had. So I think we've had a lax period in terms of the planning office. And um, so I, I guess I'm going to vote against this one. You have to keep in mind those same taxpayers are paying taxes in, too. All right. Are we um, <clears throat> ready to move the, move the question? Move the question? All those in favor? Two, three, four. Two, three, four. Any, and the opposed? Two, three. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, students, for your opinions. Now you move on to item 34. Thank, Thank you, Maureen, also for your presentation and for your time here tonight, which is only one of the nights that you're out. <laughs> um, then there's item 35, a new and different item for everyone who's been in the council before. Uh, I will let the council make this for the public. This is action pursuant to the council manager charter to approve the surety amount and bond for the town manager for the faithful discharge of his duties, as stated in our charter. I will turn this over to the manager. The, as uh, Chairman Carson mentioned, the council is required to set the amount of the bond that you cover the town manager for. What, what this is is that if I took money from the till or if I made some decision that uh, ended up costing the town a fortune because of an inaction, something I didn't do. Uh, this could be something you'd go against this particular bond. What the amount should be, you know, is indeterminate. Uh, Two million is more than it used to be. It used to be down around a million. It's an expensive policy. It's $5,000. Uh, this was included as part of the bid process in the, when we recently went out to bid with our insurance. This was part of that package. It's not a new cost. It was in the budget. Uh, and in fact, it's overall that insurance policy is $8,000 below budget. Ironically, the amount you just approved on the last <laughs> item. Uh, but anyway, this is the surety bond. And you know, I would like to say, though, is, you know, and I, in, in interest of full disclosure, is that the town budget now, including school and town, is a little over 23, 24 million when you include all, all of the different funds. Uh, you know, just this week, another account was set up for nearly $2 million for Cross Hill that I have access to in terms of, uh, you know, something could happen uh, or, any, or any town manager. So, you know, we are looking now. Also, if you look at all of the money that comes in and all that goes out during the year, it's closer to, you know, $80 million roughly in all of the, the debits and the credits. So, you know, we're, we're a very large business, and $2 million is not a whole lot, but, but it is the amount that, that I would recommend, and I uh, would uh, recommend that you uh, set this amount for the bond and uh, authorize the payment. So I'm oh. Thank you. I can't Tom, believe I'd like to ask a question. All right. Councilor McGinty, who, who has a question? Who, who, Councilor McGinty. Who, who does this protect? Does it protect you, protect us? Mm -hmm. No, it, it protects you against me. <laughs> okay, good. All right. How quick they are to do this, Michael. I can hardly believe it. Or, or anyone else that's in my position. <laughs> or anybody acting in concert or active participation with you? That might be right, Henry. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever you said. Now, somebody just moved it. Who just moved it? Mm -hmm. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Just a comment. Perry. I think they did a terrible job at the insurance company. No reflection whatsoever on our manager, who did an excellent job. But in the form of this bond, they had the town of Cape Elizabeth and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, yeah. and I think that's inexcusable. Uh, since 1820, when I was be. born. The place of business is in Braintree. Yeah. <laughs> there is a corrected copy. I understand we have a corrected copy, but we should not need a corrected copy from a competent insurance company, and I hope that will uh, come to their attention the next time this comes around. How long has it been? Henry. 1820? That was the year I was born. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's move the question. All those in favor? Opposed? 
None. The motion carries. You should. I think you students should bring the. Uh, do you have a copy of this bond that says Massachusetts on it? Commonwealth. Yeah. August 33rd. It says. Yeah. I can't say as I noticed that one. I think the insurance company had a temporary working on that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been moved and seconded and passed. <laughs> Just as the lawyers are not working in the planning office, Henry. I didn't hear what she said. Item number 36, consideration of the annual Maine Municipal Association mail ballot, mail, M-A-I-L. <laughs> And designation of a voting delegate to the annual MMA convention. Is this, is yes, I would like to mention that Councillor Ruth Watson dutifully served as a member of the MMA nominating committee and that there is a candidate by petition on the ballot on Arnold J. Gross. And based on Councillor Watson's participation in the nominating committee, I would suggest that the council cast its ballot for the nominating committee's recommendations. I so move. I would Second. suggest as well. <laughs> It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yeah. You okay. also need to, uh, the second part of that, the is the voting, delegate? voting delegate to the annual MMA convention. That'll be on the Friday morning, I believe, at the end of the month, September, whatever it is, the last. At, at the Friday. MMA convention. MMA convention. For what it's worth, I'm going. You're already is, going? Is Ruth, yeah. Are you going too, Ruth? Yes, I am. Yeah. We only get one vote? One vote. You're going too, aren't you, Michael? Aren't you, I am. Wouldn't you? It's a, it's a, I'm not voting. He doesn't get to vote. Oh, you don't get to vote. No. I'm not going to okay. deal with Mr. Burroughs. You're new. You want to vote? Go ahead. I voted last year, I believe. Did you? <laughs> you oh. Ruth, you're, you're on the nominating committee. Well, I don't boring. know. Because I'm on the nominating committee, I maybe should uh, recuse myself from doing this. I would you? think. No. Maybe. maybe. All right. So you're on the nominating committee. You so, can do the vote. Yeah. Is I'm, that easy? I think that would probably be in, in a better a way to go. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Let the minutes reflect that it's been moved and seconded to Jack Roberts. <laughs> Somebody make a motion, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved second. and seconded. The minutes are now reflecting. It's been moved and seconded to Jack Roberts be the voting delegate for the MMA convention. All those in favor? Opposed? Can I just make one comment? I, this was a very interesting process for me to serve on this committee. Um, we met in Augusta for a good portion of a day with people from all over the state to come up with these names. And um, I, I didn't know quite how we were going to sift through all of the people who had come before us to be nominated. But it was really a pretty methodical process. And I learned an awful lot about people. And what I realized, too, was that I had surprised many of them because they thought I was coming from Cape Elizabeth. Little did they know that I grew up in Farmington and had some Wilton and Farmington connections as well. And not that I'm biased anyway, but there are several Wilton and Farmington people on this nominating <laughs> committee. So uh, I, it was very um, you were a educational. Ringer. I was a ringer. It was very educational for me, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, as I, I do all of my participation in the Legislative Policy Committee or any of the other endeavors of the May Municipal Association. So I would encourage any counselors who have any interest whatsoever to get involved in the MMA because it's um, very educational. I found it very worthwhile. Thank you. Item number 37, action to approve the town treasurer's opening of an account at Key Private Bank for funds held in escrow for the Cross Hill subdivision. The manager, please. Yeah, this is uh, just one of those issues that we, sometimes we have a letter of credit, sometimes we have a performance guarantee. In the case of this particular subdivision, it's an escrow account. Uh, the monies have been deposited. It was uh, just short of 1.9 million. And what those will be used for is, as the project is completed, those funds will be released and the, the contractor, RJ Grondon, uh, will be paid uh, by, the, by the developer. And this merely puts it on record for the auditor that, that the account exists and then they know that they have to, to look at it. It's a money market mutual fund. And, uh, that's what it is. It'll be gone by the end of the year. Roughly. Council McGinty. I have a question. These are non-insured vehicles. That's right. What kind of liability do we um, assume? We would have the liability. You know, it was the, the owner of the development, Doug Shea, that arranged this through, pri through the private bank. It was his choice. Where, where our responsibility would come would be if Key Bank failed, or Key Bank private bank failed, you know, didn't honor it, and then R.J. Grondon also failed in the performance of the duty. 
uh, there'd be a double hit. So the bank, in essence, the bank, you're telling me the bank has to fail for us to have any liability? Key private bank would have to fail, and R.J. Grondin would also not carry out the commitment. Be those two things. The actual escrow agreement and all the different terms of, in it that back up this account uh, were reviewed and negotiated between Mike Hill, the, the town's attorney, in this matter, and uh, the attorney for uh, Mr. Shea. Madam Chairman, I move that uh, uh, town treasurer be uh, uh, authorized to uh, open an account at Key Private Bank for funds held in escrow for the Cross Hill subdivision. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Well, it, he says it's about a million nine hundred thousand dollars, and we've just bonded him for two million dollars. So, I <laughs> so we want to put the one point nine in the motion. Uh, not to exceed. No, not to exceed. <laughs> right. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? How quick we can go for this one point nine, and we have this trouble with eighty four hundred dollars. <laughs> Item number 38, auction to authorize the town treasurer to, to participate in the direct purchase service of the MBIA Municipal Investors Service Corporation. Michael. Yes, the town council had earlier authorized us to participate with the MBIA class program, mm -hmm. which is a very similar program to this one, except for this one allows longer maturities and what they invest in is government securities, uh, uh, you know, uh, government bonds, uh, Fannie Mae, uh, <clears throat> All guaranteed principal. Is there any discussion? Questions? So moved, I guess. Mm -hmm. Allow it. Second. Anybody second? Second. second. I was going to say, Henry. You missed one. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Doing the best I can. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> oh. Thank you very much. This ends this part of the agenda items. I wanted to, the next item is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. I did want to ask, mention that I was very grateful for the students' participation tonight and for your comments, which I found very enlightening. I hope that you will feel free when you, when you can latch on to any one of these subjects and you have something to say that you should be able to do that. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any items uh, not on the agenda from the citizens? Madam if, Chairman, mm -hmm. um, may I? Absolutely, a citizen. <laughs> um, I'd like to propose that the town council have a workshop, set up a workshop meeting uh, with the Parks and Recreation Department uh, or the Conservation Department decision makers there that could come and talk with us and discuss the uh, dogs on Crescent Beach issue. Um, I think that as, as winter is coming, um, this has really been a change in at least policy, I mean, tradition, I guess you would say, to not have any dogs be on the beach during the winter and fall, which is my main concern, I think. It's um, a place sometimes where, because of our weather, uh, it's, it's the only place that dogs and people can get some exercise when there's some icy pavements and that sort of thing. So. I would hope that we might be able to um, develop some sort of compromise where we might be able to get onto the beach. I would be happy to set a workshop. We probably uh, might come up with some other items, but that certainly is an item that, that I personally have received phone calls uh, yeah. about, and it's probably timely that we talk about it in a way that we can maybe make some sort of compromises. And, and, uh, can we, and we're not talking about the town parks. We're talking about the state parks state. people. Yeah. Can we yeah. get... Yeah. These, can we, Michael and I will, and we'll work out a date and a time and see if we can get those people and uh, to have an open discussion about this. Well, a precursor to that might be to even find out if they'll even have a discussion with us. If, there's well, any, if, if we, their law will even allow them to make a variation in, in our beaches versus other beaches. Oh, we certainly, would, so we, we certainly will find that out. But we I, I can understand that, that um, difficulty if they're going to have, the rule applies to all state beaches yeah. in Sebago Lake State Park. Um, but it is a rule, it's not statute, so that uh, the department 
should have a process for, for yeah. evaluating it. Through the Maine Administrative Procedures Act, the department has the authority to, to go through a rulemaking process, and that's how state park rules are developed. And I know it is an issue that they've heard both sides of the story on from people who like the dogs on the beach and those that don't. I'm glad that Carol brought that up because I think it's worth taking a look at, particularly in the winter months well, that's and, what and, the, about. and the late fall. I would really like us to be able to, the citizens and their animals, to go back on our beaches. Councilor Roberts. I heard from a number of people in, back in May of the similar subject, but if we're going to be working with the state and doing something this winter, we do need to move quickly. Oh, yes. Otherwise, it'll be May before. That's the, right. That's right. Well, we'll uh, I'll talk with the manager tomorrow. We'll we'll see what we can do about that. Manager, I wonder if we might want to get our uh, state representatives involved uh -huh. this, to see if they can help us out any way, too. Good idea. Okay. I'll present each of them with a puppy next week. <laughs> <laughs> Since I almost have that ability right now to do that. Uh, all right. Item number 39 is action upon request of the town manager to enter into executive session to discuss property acquisition and disposition matters. Um, <clears throat> at this time, it's anticipated by the manager that we will take. We no, certainly, no action. No action. It's simply a discussion. Okay. Um, but the, but the, the, the we should tell them. TV will yeah. So this virtually ends the TV section of this town meeting. We will be back uh, after our executive session. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, students. We really appreciate that. Now, bring this dog issue up and discuss that. Next time you'll have an opinion. We'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs>